In his book, The Modern Functional Building, this is what I have, of 1926, <clears throat> Bene demanded a new architecture, no longer working with forms, but with reality itself. No longer ornating life of individuals, but enriching the life of the community at large. It would turn away from the forms of enclosure in order to grasp the realities of life directly, as Bene pointed out, Quote, <clears throat> it will be anxious about realism, not about feelings or souls. In this book of 1926, the turning over of architecture to reality is introduced by three steps of an architectural revolution in the name of modern reality. I'll show you the uh, three, sorry, titles of the, the captions, I will then translate to you in a, in a second. <clears throat> Everything should be stripped down to its functional essence and reinvented. This then would lead to an aesthetic as modern as the message was messianic. This three-step revolution, as indicated by the captions for the three chapters of the book, started with the discharging of the facade. According to functionalist building theory of one-way design direction from inside to the outside only. It reads, no more facade but house. This meant the overcoming of superficial representation in favor of the real functional modalities which a house incorporates as a unit. The second step, no more house but formed space, made clear that the house as an organization of balanced or mostly symmetrically ordered shapes and spaces is not an idee fix which should be given up, is only an idee fix which should be given up for a free <coughs> and modern forming of space according to the real needs. But Bene's questioning of architecture does not stop at this point of a possible accordance between life and architecture. As chapter 3 explains, no more formed space, but formed reality. A sentence which somehow reminds me of the maxim of Remkola's, a maximum of program and a minimum of architecture. Let us leave aside the question how the mystery of a complete transformation of formed space into formed reality can be established in reality at all, without making architecture disappear. What is more important at this point is the fact that the obedience to the necessities of modern reality implies <coughs> a negation of inner architectural rea realities. From this moment on, most of architecture's reality is excluded from modern reality, as if both life and architecture were irreconceivable enemies. Bene's argumentation enforced the dissociation of architectonic categories, categories from modern realities. It suggests the idea of the pure expression of program independent from other variables. Only when function as the dominant aspect of architectural reality would become independent of the idea of shelter represented by the house as such, it could be assumed to be directly accessible without any representational form. The possibility that the house, unlike the facade, could not only be regarded as a representational category but already as an exemplary model of formed reality does not come to be in his mind. All the more is out of reach the assumption that architectural forms themselves, like certain types of spatial organization, may be considered as formed reality, shaped by a reality revolving from the past, already having passed the test of time, thereby proving its usefulness and adaptability to life in the course of history. We will have to wait for the Italian architect Aldo Rossi and his theory of permanence for a defense of this point of view. 
In 20th century modern architecture, the dialectic opposition between utopia and reality tended to become obsolete. Utopia lost its platonic function as a contemplative, critical device and turned into a program of action to establish a new reality. On the other hand, the notion of reality was reduced to the didactic function of attesting to the utopia of modern being. In compliance with the imperatives of technology and science, industrial production and social freedom, the modern architect dedicated himself to facilitate with his designs the arrival of a new world radically different from historic experience and tradition. The marriage of utopia and realism <clears throat> into a realist utopia resulted into a substantial loss of architectural and urban reality, as we all know. Modern architecture obviously did not result <clears throat> in a better world, and the discrepancy between fiction and reality, between good intentions and bad results, became all too obvious. The anticipation of the future city resulted into the destruction of the existing historical quarters of the city. <clears throat> Its system of public spaces, of streets, squares and places was abandoned in order to establish a modern urban reality according to the principles of the Cité Contemporaine <clears throat> as pronounced by Le Corbusier, <clears throat> a city we all know consisting of freestanding more or less monotonous buildings in an open green space crossed by trajectories of motorways. In the 1960s, a final utopian outburst antedates the collapse of modern architecture entirely submitted to technological progress. Scientific fiction takes over. The futurist revival or nostalgia for the future as Colin Rowe has called the high-tech fantasies of the 60s, display <coughs> typical of session with megastructures, lightweight throwaways, over-city grids, prefabricated capsules and containers, and the integration of buildings with transport system and all sorts of tubes. I just show you to remind you of these utopias, uh, three uh, exemplars of that, Jonah Friedman's vision of a city floating above ground, more or less a cluster of, of inhabited uh, bridges detached from the ground, Kenzo Tange's project for the Tokyo Bay, uh, a swimming city cluster, <coughs> or uh, the famous Archigram walking city, terrifying machines, walking cities, as the ultimate uh, demonstration of the modernist idea of the liberation of space from place. Roy Lichtenstein, in one of his uh, images, has captured, I think, it quite well with the phrase, this must be the place, a uh, depiction <coughs> that uh, describes the rapidly changing environment of hypermodern city turning into a machinery and losing recognizable architectural and urban identity, what makes orientation difficult, if not almost impossible. The Italian group Superstudio in the 60s presented a very different kind of utopia, a negative utopia, not anticipating paradise, but hell, simply by extending the modern rationality, rationality to its logical extreme, up to the point where it collapses into hypertrophy and becomes surrealistic. Superstudio is beating the modernist ideas at their own game. Ideas that had been relevant in the first decades of 20th century <coughs> and enraptured architectural thinking and now had grown stagnant and dull. Intriguing images become representations of something horrifying. Images of an ambivalence between fascination and nightmare, which make it difficult to decide whether they are meant as radical criticism or sadistic affirmation. 
This is the famous monument, a monument to continue, the, the, the continuous monument. It can be read as a nightmarish parody of the architecture of the international style. This monument to modernism presents itself as a ubiquitous, faceless architecture, endless in repetition of identical gridded volumes. As if all architecture were to be created by a single act, distracted from a single design and spreading out across the globe without any regard to the given context. I'll show you another one. There are uh, like 15 images uh, to, where you can see how this crosses. The world here it's somewhere in an English uh, <coughs> uh, uh, city arrived. And, and we could see this continuous monument more or less like <coughs> the US version or uh, uh, late capitalist version of the Russian strip city uh, designed by Leonidov. But the 1960s were not only alone the dead end of late modern utopian architecture, this decade as well launched a new kind of realism in architecture. The difference between the old-fashioned modern realism and the new realism is marked by a significant shift. The sources of the realist architectural inspirations no longer were searched and found outside of architecture, for example, in the technological domain of airplanes, ocean liners, motor cars, and other modern machinery. In this case, they were searched and found inside the discipline of architecture and urbanism itself and its history. The Italian architect Ernesto Rogers, inspired <laughs> by neorealist film and literature, as well by social, realis uh, social realism, already in the 1950s insisted on a new realism in architecture without using this term yet. A realism which regards place more important than abstract space, a realism no longer regarding the idea of continuity in history as being incompatible with the idea of modernity in architecture and urbanism. The Torre Velasca, built in Milano in the mid-50s, has been exemplary for this attitude integrated into the urban block with a skeleton expression that vaguely corresponds with the Gothic dome. The building offers an alternative to the standard simply freestanding glass high-rise box. The return of tradition and urban context, together with a figurative program that could be more easily understood as collective language than the modern abstract formalism, should mark Italian neorealism in architecture. It included the return of symbolic representation as an essential architectural function, completely denied by functionalist architecture only recognizing technical and practical aspects. The confrontation of these two images, on top we see Le Corbusier, in the bottom it's uh, a, a design for a monument uh, in Segrate by Aldo Rossi, the young Aldo Rossi. The confrontation of these two images makes clear the different aspirations of early and late modern architecture. Le Corbusier and Rossi, both regarding themselves as modern architects, pursue a different goal. The one desires for the eclipse of architectural reality by reducing all architectural forms to mere abstract geometry, removing all tectonic expression from architecture and stripping off all classical references, only leaving over the platonic existence minimum of the self-referential play of naked volumes in the light. Rossi, not unlike Corbusier, interested in the platonics of architecture and sharing the, as well the belief that architecture derives its formal condition from geometry, half a century later reaches out into the opposite direction. Rossi wants to move the absolute and abstract again closer towards architectural reality. He recharges the platonic objects with meaning and memory through the evocation of classical references. 
In Rossi's eyes, the pure cylinder desires its morphological transformation into a column, thus becoming again a tectonic element of symbolic representation and of monumentality as well. Twenty years later, in the Palazzo Hotel in Fukuoka, Aldo Rossi attempts this, uh, expresses this attempt much clearer than in, in his uh, early design. In the 1970s, postmodernism dismisses the modernist break from the past, as well as the dogma of formal abstraction being the only true modern mode of architectural expression. With his book Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, 1966, Robert Venturi radically questioned the modernist orthodoxies. Written in Rome and being overwhelmed by the sumptuous meal which late Baroque architecture and his culture of the facade is offering to the senses, Venturi introduces to the discourse a new architectural sensibility and a different way of treating architecture. Driven by a real need, as he calls it, to re-examine the work of the past, Venturi enters the no-go era of historic architecture and its styles, discovering the vitality of double-functioning elements, juxtapositions as well as the contradiction and interplay between inside and outside. This altogether allowed Venturi to re-evaluate re the facade as a symbolic surface and as an architectural event occurring at the meeting of interior and exterior forces of use and space. Re recognizing the difference between inside and outside, Venturi further concluded that the facade even, to quote, would open the door once again to an urbanistic point of view. With a recommendation to use conventions in an unconventional manner, this was the vivid lesson of pop art realism, the imagery of architecture become, becomes heated up. Postmodern architecture involved conventional elements like cornice and or column, whether literal or representational. With the rediscovery of metaphor and symbol, classical elements were integrated into a postmodern building most easily as a piece of newspaper in a cubist collage. Fragments could be pieced together without regard to their past compositional rules in a bizarre new syntax, making the facade to return even in its parody as a detached mask. This is a design by Vituri, Venturi himself for a country house with a, a facade that looks like it was done with a fret saw. <coughs> if only in a rudimentary and crippled form, the postmodernist cocktail, however, wakened the consciousness for the phenomenological realities of architecture as a system of symbolic representation and as an autonomous discipline as well as a civic institution. With late modernism or postmodernism, a new realism was introduced to the architectural discourse simply by the range of the choices of the sources mattering. Venturi's realist statement, Main Street is almost all right, together with his theory of the ugly and ordinary, led him to the perversely brilliant study learning from Las Vegas in order to learn a lesson about visual communication taught by the banalities of commercial urban reality. From this reality, Venturi derived his well-known architectural prototypes, the duck and the decorated shed. The one was the all-too-realistic duck in honor to the duck-shaped drive-in restaurant, pointing at the building sculpture where space and building structure submerge to the overall symbolic form. The other, the opposite type to this exotic example of modernist symbolic functionalism was the decorated shed. In this case, the systems of space and structure are directly at service of the program and the signifying surface with its applied symbols 
exists independently or rather independently of them. As extremes, both prototypes were helpful. The decorated shed allowed Venturi to connect to the past and treat Renaissance palazzi as boxes with decoration on or uh, <coughs> even to discover the Roman triumphal arch as a dominant sign in space to be a forerunner of the billboard. This is a double page out of learning from Las Vegas. The duck as a symbol for the dominance of sign over space in modern commercial architectures somehow anticipates the iconic buildings of current modern architecture of today's commercial reality with its media obsession. Venturi's critical assessment that the modernist architects have been designing dead ducks might also be expanded towards today's signature buildings designed by star architects. It is their business to secure the production of outstanding spectacular mega sculptures as architectural sensations, which want to make us believe that the attraction of attention has to be the prime function of architecture. This is another drawing I love uh, from Venturi. Mini mega structures are mostly ducks. I show a mini mega structure of the 90s. Uh, uh, the Bilbao effect was uh, labeled like this. This is what all Venturi already describes. The European postmodern contribution to realism in architecture, however, points into a very different direction. It does not embrace architectural history as a repository of images waiting to be adopted and manipulated. Instead, history is the object of in investigation in order to discern a set of still valid ideas and principles which transform and recombine themselves in the course of time. In particular, the work of Aldo Rossi spurred the rehabilitation of the realist paradigm by examining the city in its built form as a collective and public artifact. This is the book uh, L'Architectura della Città published 1966 in the same year when Venturi published his uh, Complexity and Contradiction. I think it's very interesting to see that this happens in the same moment basically. This approach of Rossi's combined the return to the traditional city with abstract analytical reading focusing on building types, the system of public spaces and places, and relating them to the empirical reality of the urban habitat. For Rossi, the city is a product of history and collectivity. It slowly assumes its form by the sedimentation of lived life. The layers of past generations, contributions adding up to another in the course of the centuries shape the formal and cultural identity of the city as a collective artifact, we could say, of formed reality to refer once again to Adolf Behner's terminology. Contrary to the modernist point of view regarding the architecture of the past to be more an obstacle to life, instead its appropriate support, Rossi trusts into the continuous historical process of morphological transformation of forms and types confirming to the necessities of life. The return of an urbanistic point of view, to quote Venturi again, is indeed the significant contribution of the European realism after 1966. The theoretical debate of the late 1970s about realism in architecture and urbanism, touching upon both on urban iconography and typology, uh, initiated a shift in urban building policy. It turned away from massive large-scale interventions to a more careful handling of the existing historic structures and their modernization or adequate replacement. I'll show you just as a document the two issues of the Swiss magazine Architese from 1975 starting with Venturi and a year later uh, with the project of Grassi on the cover uh, referring to 
uh, the urban discourse. And another publication from this year, I think which is quite important, is this one uh, by Leon Kria. The reconstruction of the European city, this is the subtitle of this exhibition that he arranged uh, in London in 1975 and then with the catalogue appeared again in Brussels in 1978, curated by Leon Kria. The reconstruction of the European city became the new headline for architectural realism. In this catalog are presented various unbuilt urban design projects and competition entries, for example, one of Korea himself, and uh, which helped to prepare the ground for projects being implemented in the next decades. This is Leon Kria's uh, competition entry for the La Villette, La Villette uh, competition 1976, and one sees that he is still inclined towards modern architecture with some nostalgic references to the airplanes as they were shown in Le Corbusier version architecture, perhaps also uh, 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 is some uh, references made to Leonidov. Uh, well, th I'll leave this open. Leon Kriers uh, Villette is just one of these projects that shows that architecture now deals with the real city, has had given up the open uh, uh, space idea of the uh, uh, Corbusier Cité Contemporaine, but it returns back to the reality or to the structure of the European city with its streets, its system of public spaces, uh, squares, uh, neighborhoods, and so on. The new urbanism, uh, urban realism was as well raised utopian desires for the Città Ideale, for the ideal city, by looking at the city as a whole and making an attempt to the reconstruction of its plan, leaving aside existing modern building structures. This drawing here on the top, by not by uh, Leon Krier, but his brother Rob Krier, shows uh, the southern Friedrichstadt in Berlin, uh, that uh, in the 70s developed, as you can see uh, below. And uh, here, he, in his image, the view from the clouds from above uh, uh, shows clearly in what direction, which direction he wants to go. Leon Krier, the brother, a decade later, celebrated the escape from contemporary urban reality into a regressive utopia with idyllic drawings of an almost archaic pre-industrial town life undisturbed by any modernist ugliness. So the new realist approach towards the city, no matter how realistically at all, instigated projects of reurbanization and urban redevelopment in a number of European cities like London, Brussels, Barcelona, Amsterdam, or Berlin. Here I'm showing again, it's the same side, you can see the rondelle on the uh, bottom of the image. This is what the new projects in Berlin that have been uh, built and planned between 1990 and 2010. So it's not a complete uh, a revolving of the structure, but it is a careful uh, adaption to the structure and a reinforcement of what is already there. Let me come to an end. Reality can be understood in a narrow and a broad sense. The same is true for the desire called utopia. Utopia is not a concept for doing terrible things with a good conscience. This is what the political utopianism of 20th century has taught us as a lesson never to forget. Utopia is a mode of viewing re reality independently from its status quo. Its double function is to reach out into two directions. The one allows us to approach the ideal and acquaint us with the unforeseen in order to make it become our own. The other allows us to gain the necessary distance from ourselves and from reality to overlook both <coughs> reality and ourselves from a higher point of view. Utopianism 
aiming at final solutions is a nightmare. It supports either the naive messianic running on ahead towards some final destination or the fundamentalism of total rejection of what is there in order to start it all over again from a point zero of innocence. Boy, both cases result into the turning over and sacrificing of reality to the tyranny of a fixed idea. Realism is of course not the simple affirmation of what is already there and or the idea of freezing the status quo. Realists can be hostile to reality as we have seen by reductively abstracting a single aspect of it as an absolute and normative. Realism includes the awareness of different competing realities and it includes a critical consciousness about the sources and the conditions of the real. Realism in architecture is, as Manfredo Tafuru had it, not an assured construction, nor a tendency or a movement, but an attitude which runs across the history of 19th and 20th century architecture. Tafuri's observation can be generalized a little bit further. Realistically seen, architecture can be regarded as a kind of built optimism. Architecture's productions are not only a real investment into the present and its culture, but as well into the future. Architecture needs to be trusted to stand up firmly as useful construction for some span of time, thus sustaining its value and meaning, not for eternity, but perhaps for the next generation to follow, or maybe even more. In other words, architecture as a built reality depends on some small-scale utopianism, as far as it does not only want to be concerned as an ephemeral phenomenon of the day. In architecture, reality and utopia constantly overlap and complement each other. And it is not easy to isolate the one from the other. To end this lecture, I'd like to return to its begin, to Mies van der Rohe. We have met as the apologist of realism of the now in 1923, insisting on a rigid division between the realistic and the utopian. Only one year later, Mies questions his narrow-minded idea when in June 1924 he ends a public lecture with the following sentence, a sentence describing reality and utopia in their condition of a dialectic pair of opposites. I quote, we do want to stand with both feet firmly on the ground, but with our head we want to reach to the clouds. Thank you.